Hey everybody, you're tuned in to 91.8 The Fan. This is Kana, and you're here for Kana's Corner. But I'm not here alone, actually. I have a wonderful person from across the ocean who has joined me today. Would you care to introduce yourself? Hello everybody, uh, my name is Andy Hanley, and I'm one of the lead writers for the UK Anime Network. Can you explain to us what the UK Anime Network is, for those of us who don't look for UK sites? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly I can. Um, basically, the UK Anime Network is... Um, one of, if not the biggest, and certainly one of the oldest um, websites that uh, deals with anime, manga, so on and so forth in the UK. Um, obviously, we uh, sort of have the usual uh, news, reviews, articles, um, all sorts of stuff going on. Um, at the moment, we're currently working towards um, offering streaming video from Crunchyroll on our website, so we're kind of covering the whole range of, of anime-related goodies in the UK, effectively. Oh, very nice. So you guys have your hands in kind of everything. Yeah, we, we try to sort of cover everything that we, we can within the, the UK industry, really. And now, with the I don't know very much about the UK industry, obviously, because I've never been outside the state, more or less outside the country. So could you I explain a little bit about things that are very significant there? Yep, sure. I mean, obviously, um, here in the UK, the anime industry as a whole is a whole lot smaller than it is in the US for obvious reasons, you know, being a much smaller country. Um, so as far as kind of releases go, you know, we don't get quite the same sort of breadth and, and depth that you get over there. But um, we do have three sort of big distributors of anime um, who obviously kind of do their best to, to bring out all the, the big releases and, and all the stuff that the fans want. Um, similarly with stuff like uh, conventions and, and expos and so on, you know, we don't have any massive ones like the States do, but uh, we do have a fair number of conventions right around the country that uh, are varying sizes that, you know, anime fans go to. Um, there's quite a big kind of, uh, quite a lot of cosplaying that's kind of building up within the, within the UK as well. Um, and a lot of that kind of ties into probably the biggest anime and sort of manga and cosplay related event in the UK, which is the uh, the MCM London Expo, which takes place twice a year. And that's that's kind of more the, the mostly the gathering place, I guess, for, for sort of anime fans in the UK. Uh, the last one had 40, over 41,000 people attended, which was a record for, for that expo. Oh, very nice. So you guys are getting to a point where, I, I, that, what it sounds like to me, you guys are getting to a point where you'll start growing and you'll see things like Anime Expo, which is insane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's certainly, you know, it's it's something that's, that seems to be getting bigger and bigger by the year. And I mean, talking about London Expo, you know, they're trying to get uh, more and more kind of big guests in, in on that kind of thing, you know, like your, your Anime Expo. I mean, uh, this May we had uh, Yuri Lowenthal and Tara Platt turned up. Um, last October we had uh, Masahiro Ando, who's the director of Sword in the Stranger, and uh, Masahiko Minami, who's one of the uh, creators of, of Studio Bones, so we've actually had a couple of Japanese guests over. So I think hopefully, you know, a lot of the guests who have come over have been quite surprised by how sort of, you know, how keen the fans are and how many there are. So I think, you know, things are building up and, and the UK is getting a bit more of a reputation as, you know, somewhere where people are interested in anime we're not we're not kind of some some backwater somewhere i don't know off the top of my head i have to think that getting japanese guests is cheaper for you guys than getting american guests or voice actors yeah i, I don't know how how, uh, how that works to be honest in in terms of, of cost and, and flight times and things i think we might actually be be a bit further away than than you guys in a sense but uh, but hopefully you know that as we say those those japanese sort of guys who did come over last October were really sort of impressed and, and really positive about the experience so hopefully it'll be the start of a lot more. Now you talked a little bit earlier about three different uh, companies that essentially do the licensing and publishing correct? Yes that's right. And now I'm sure you guys get your fair share of Ichi titles but uh, do you always commonly get the, the popular titles or do you get anything that's you know something nobody expected? Um, well it, things have developed a little bit interestingly just over the last couple of months I mean typically what tends to happen is that um, shows get licensed and, and you know acquired in the US and in North America first and then they tend to kind of filter down to us that way um, the main reason for that is because obviously dubbing an anime series is pretty expensive 
So what tends to happen is that uh, you know the UK companies will wait and they'll either sub-license the series from, say, Funimation in the US, and you know with that they'll get the dub and you know the subtitles, the whole kind of package, or they'll they will get it sort of from the Japanese producers, but again. They'll basically, you know, pay for the dub that the the U.S. company has made because I mean, basically, there's no kind of dubbing sort of studios, and, and say the cost of dubbing is simply too expensive to be done for the the sort of the small quantities that are sold in the U.K. So really, what tends to happen is, you know, all the big titles we get. I mean, obviously, you get your Bleach, your Naruto, uh, you know, stuff like Ghost in the Shell, all, all that kind of things. You know, we get, but uh, a lot of the more kind of not so much obscure titles, but titles that they feel won't sell in huge numbers over here, so perhaps they're kind of fan favourites, but they're not particularly mainstream. We do tend to sometimes miss out on. Um, I mean, what's changed a little bit as of uh, sort of the announcements that, that have come in the last sort of month or so is that um, Visa Entertainment, one of the, those big three distributors, have announced that they're going to actually start releasing subtitle-only series, which is, I know, some, something that the likes of Sentai in the US have been doing for a little while now with some success. So um, the first series that they've announced for the UK is actually Jirara, which obviously has been on Crunchyroll and is, you know, pretty popular for, for very good reasons. So we've actually had that announced before. It's... Uh, been announced in the US, which is a bit of a first for us, I think, really over here in the UK. So, you know, we're, we're things are, are sort of shifting and, and changing slightly, and the whole kind of subtitle only thing is going to be a bit of an experiment over here to see how well it sells. But uh, hopefully, if it does, you know, I think we'll start seeing our sort of release schedule over here pick up a bit rather than just being sort of an offshoot of what happens in, in the States. Very nice, and I mean, I will say I, I can't vouch for Sentai Filmworks or anything of the sort, but I've been hearing over here that they're testing it, they're testing it, and now they're starting to be like, hey, maybe we should go back and dub these. <laughs> so yeah. I don't know how well it's doing. Yeah, I mean, from what I've heard, they're doing pretty well. I mean, what's happening is obviously some of the more popular shows that, you know, they sell enough so that they can then afford to, to go back and do the dub. And I mean, similarly with Beez's, um announcements over here, you know, they have said... If any of these shows do get a dub from a US company later on, we'll go back, we'll re-release it with that dub and, you know, we'll try to kind of sweeten the deal for people who have already bought the, the subtitled version to, you know, kind of do it at, at some sort of discount. So it, it'll be interesting to, to see how it works. But, I mean, hopefully I'm I'm personally been kind of pushing that somebody should at least give this a try, you know, releasing subtitle only shows because, you know, I know a lot of fans get kind of annoyed having to wait so long for, for shows to be released so I'm, I'm pleased that they're trying it and obviously if it doesn't work out it doesn't work out no i totally understand and i have to wonder you know since you guys mostly get your dubs from the u.s are you scared to hear all this you know hubble loo about everybody like we're dying we're raising the white flag you know bang zoom gave in that uh, anime rest in peace article and funimation being like we're okay we're okay we're just being sold <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, it is a, a little bit concerning. I mean, certainly talking to the UK distributors, which we you know we have a pretty good relationship with uh, here at the UK Anime Network. I mean, they, they don't seem too too concerned about things. Certainly, the Funimation side of things sounds like, if anything, it's going to be a net positive because they've pretty much sort of outgrown their their parent company and you know if they can go off and, and do their own thing and you know possibly get a bit more money behind them because of that I think that can only be positive um the, the dubbing side of things is interesting I mean you know we've seen you know we now have Aniplex who are going to kind of step into the market in the US releasing subtitle only shows so whether the dub industry for anime is dying and you know who who is responsible for that it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out over the next few years but i think certainly for mainstream shows you know the, the likes of bleach and Naruto, as i mentioned earlier you know they sell a lot of copies here and in the u.s a lot of people want to have those shows dubbed so i don't think it's going to die completely but maybe they'll just be be less dubbed series for us to enjoy that's true. And at the same time, I still think there's something else, you know. Obviously, you know, markets go up, they go down, but there has to be a way for them to come back. And I want to know what that coming back is. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really the last sort of year or so in particular has, has kind of been the start of a, a big change, I think, for for anime outside of Japan. Because, you know, now we have Crunchyroll and we have other streaming services coming online 
it's kind of changed the game a little bit for everybody. I mean, again, talking to the UK distributors, you know, they they're quite happy to acknowledge that now those streaming sites are, you know, a competitor to them. And I think that's why they're kind of looking to release shows faster and, and you know, get what the fans want, you know, onto onto DVD, onto Blu-ray, you know, get get them the stuff packaged together because otherwise, you know, they're, they're going to lose out in this sort of uh, instant gratification age where we can just log on and, you know, watch whatever we like online. Ah, uh, yes. But we were going to take a short break there, but keep it tuned because we will talk more about how it is to be an anime fan in the UK. So stay tuned to 91.8 The Fan. Everything you want, nothing you don't. Ever wonder what's going on in the anime world? Check out 918 The Fan every weekday for the newest eye stock. We'll fill you in on everything you need to know in three minutes or less. Only on... 918thefan.com Hey everybody, we're back. I did not chase away my guest, even though I teased him with the whole T and Crumpets joke. I'm so good at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, like I say, I mean, I do I do eat tea and crumpets occasionally, so I can't even deny your, your accusations. So, so you're, you're safe on that one. Haha! <laughs> uh, I would like to say, though, I, I wanted to inquire about this because we had a few uh, UK fans uh, asking us, you know, about what is the anime ban over there, for those who don't know, and could you explain what your opinions are on it? Yep, certainly. I mean, to kind of clarify to start with, it's not an anime ban per se. Um, what's happened is a law has been passed that is kind of, I think it's its unofficial name, but it's unofficially known as the Dangerous Cartoons Act. Um, and basically what that law states is that uh, it's really, its idea is to, to ban kind of um, any sort of images of, of children being kind of exploited sexually effect effectively. Um, obviously the issue with that when it comes to anime is kind of where you draw the line because you have a lot of series with characters that either look very young or are very young there's quite often some sort of you know sexual situations whether it's just you know your plain old fan service or whatever and you know there's the worry is that you know there are shows that are simply not gonna make it over here just because of that law um, I mean, what we've seen so far certainly is um, the release of Code Geass R2 um, here in the UK, which is literally, it's actually not out yet, but we uh, managed to get DVDs at London Expo. Um, there's actually been a one second cut from an episode of that on its DVD release. Um, in a rather kind of bizarre set of circumstances, there's a, a kind of like a little slideshow from one of the characters on their sort of on their camera phone, and one of the shots shows um, Shirley being groped by some other girl, and there's a younger girl in the background watching it, and apparently that, that cut had to be made because it showed an underage girl viewing a sexual situation and so that basically had to be cut that single second but it had to be cut from from the release because it was in contravention of, of that act from from what the actual distributor tells us um and we're kind of on a more general scale you know we've from talking to to the sort of the, the big three distributors there's sort of a reticence to pick up certain shows because they're worried that they will get caught up in this law in some way not so much that you know they'll end up being arrested and chained up and taken away but more that they'll be forced to make cuts to these series and obviously that's a pretty big expense for these otherwise quite small com uh, companies where you know you're going to have to start cutting out a few seconds here and then you know how how do you go about that and will you even get permission to do that from the original Japanese producers so it's not a kind of end of the world oh god all anime has been banned kind of thing but it, it is something that is going to have to be taken into consideration as as long as the law is in force and you know it might mean cuts like we've already seen with Code Geass R2 and it might even mean that some shows just don't get picked up because it's seen as too much of a risk by the distributors. Now for clarification in that scene were they nude when she groped her or was she in her bathing suit or something or was it just over clothes? Um, the, the actual groupage was overclosed. Uh, the girl in the background was kind of was covering her chest with her hands but was otherwise kind of and I, I think she had like a towel around her or something. I can't I can't remember. I didn't study it too too intently to be fair. But um but yeah it wasn't it wasn't so much that the girl was topless but covering her chest. 
according to the actual the, the BBFC, which is like the classification sort of committee in the UK that that rates uh, DVDs before they can be released, their their reason for that cut was supposedly that it was a young girl viewing a sexual situation, viewing this groping, rather than the fact that she was actually topless but covering her chest herself. Okay, I see. I understand. I was just curious. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I wanted to know the the absolute details of the gropage, and so. <laughs> Have, so that's the only effect you've seen so far, and then the sort of way that the companies are kind of scared to take a risk on more of the Ichi anime. Yeah, yeah. I mean, certainly the the sort of the shows kind of like uh, say Strike, which is probably a, a prime example of that. I mean, we don't actually get a lot of those shows licensed over here, to be honest. They they very rarely sort of make it from from the US to the UK. I mean, even before this this whole Dangerous Cartoons Act, uh, it is it's kind of strange in a way because you know we've we've had the comment before when we've talked uh, spoken to some of the kind of the licensing companies over here that you know the the shows with the fan service tend to sell the most copies but uh, it still seems to be something that that gets shied away from here possibly because quite some time ago there was a a lot of uh, controversy o- over a release over here it got picked up by the media and uh, and the headline that caught everybody's sort of attention at the time simply read ban this sick filth and it's kind of the, the industry sort of recovered from the bad press of that, but I think they're still feeling that they don't want to kind of push it too far and end up in, in the papers again with for, you know, promoting goodness knows what sort of deviancy. Oh, wow. Can I ask what the subject matter was? Um, it was some unpronounceable... Um, very uh, sexual show that um, I can't I can't actually remember the name of it offhand. But I mean, this was back in the early '90s, I think it was. Um, and yeah, it was it was a show released by uh, by Manga, I think, over here. And it kind of it was just one of those typical kind of knee jerk newspaper reactions that decided because this particular film had you know tentacle sex and goodness knows what else that oh all anime must be terrible and it should all be banned and it, it just became a big newspaper campaign for sort of a couple of weeks until everyone forgot about it wow this sounds like great play <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if you're familiar with that but it seems like you are uh we keep hearing about that over here cnn keeps doing you know their their lovely interesting I guess news articles is what you call that about on those, but it's it's funny people won't let it rest, and I guess that's sort of what you guys are experiencing a little. Yeah, it's it's pretty much exactly the same thing. I think there probably has been some coverage of the whole rape play thing over here as well. It just hasn't got, it didn't get quite the critical mass that it, it has over there. Um, and I mean, again, you know, it's it's another kind of question that comes out of this dangerous cartoon act. I mean, we've been uh, reviewing. Um, games and we've we've done an interview with manga gamer who have obviously you know are bringing out quite a few sort of adult visual novels which you know we can buy online in the uk and you know there have been questions about about that and you know whether potentially buying and owning these games you know is it illegal in the uk or is it not i mean nobody's kind of made any ruling or judgment either way but uh, you know it's, it's another potential concern if, if you you know going and, and buying this stuff online you know if if for some reason, you know, your computer got searched by the police, you know, do you have a, a legal leg to stand on or not? And until it actually happens and it gets tested in a court of law, we can't really say either way. Now, I have to wonder, there is that stereotype, and I think this came more from the video game aspect, that in the UK you guys were always really okay with sex, but you guys weren't okay with gore. Does that still stand true today and reflect at all in this sort of situation? Um... I suppose so. I mean, we don't we certainly we don't have any particular kind of laws, you know, banning sort of violence and gore in in games, anime, or, or whatever. I mean, you know, you look at companies like Germany where you know these games get basically sort of edited down, so you're not killing people, you're killing zombies, and they have green blood, not red, and so on and so forth. We don't have any of that. I mean, you know, you can you can buy games as violent as you like, and and there's nothing to to stop that. Um, I mean, we do have. Uh, as I mentioned, for sort of the anime and, and sort of video release side of things, we do have the BBFC, which is the British um, Film Classification Board, and basically they have guidelines that they work by to, to rate every release. And um, basically, if, if you can't pass those guidelines to some extent, 
and they can't give it you know an 18 rating so that you know 18 year olds and over can can play it or watch it or whatever then basically you, you can't release it effectively um so again we've had sort of cuts um based around kind of not so much violence i mean there's a paranoia agent had a a cut because there was a scene showing uh, attempted suicide that was that was cut but in terms of video games no i mean we, we have controversy over stuff like manhunt and grand theft auto all the usual kind of stuff but in general terms no there's there's nothing you know too too bad going on there you know you can you can pretty much buy whatever you like as, as far as that goes within reason Right, I understand. And actually, kind of to switch gears here, do you guys uh, yourself, uh, not just yourself, but uh, UK Anime, do you guys go to conventions at all, like, and report on those? Um, yes, yeah, we tend to, to sort of go to them as and when we can. Um, I mean, I've got to admit, I've only been to, to one myself, and that was Iacon last summer, which was which was great fun. But, uh, yeah, I mean, certainly London Expo, we always turn out at, you know, we always try and uncover it uh interview some of the distributors some of the other guests that are, are there and so on and so forth um so yeah you know we normally try to to turn up as and when we can you know a to report on it and b because it's a, a good opportunity to have fun and uh, have people buy you beer <laughs> do you guys have any that you have planned for you know until 2010 the end of 2010 um as far as UK Anime Network visiting anywhere? Probably not. The next London Expo is at the end of October. That's actually been extended out to, well, three days, two and a half days, effectively, so we'll certainly be at, at that and making our presence felt. Um, as far as conventions go, possibly not this year, not that, that I know of. Um, there is an event in London not this coming weekend, but the weekend after that we might well be at. Uh, that's in, in North London. Um, and I think that's going to have it's, it's relatively s small scale i believe but uh but yeah we, we might have somebody at that but uh, there's we tend to kind of wing it a little bit and, and you know if somebody's free then then we'll we'll go along and, and enjoy the ride I, I i know about that totally so <laughs> i can totally relate to that one i would like to say if our fans are looking for any updates uh, where can they go do you guys have social media or anything yep. like that? Yep, certainly. Um, we do have a Facebook page. Um, we're on Twitter at uh, UK Anime, all one word, rather, uh, rather cleverly. Um, and obviously, our website is www.uk-anime.net. Very nice. And so, we'll make sure to keep tabs on you. Is there anything else you'd like to say, or anything you'd like to clarify to our American listeners who are totally clueless or stereotypical? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, not uh, not particularly. Um, I mean, obviously, you know, it's uh, it's just a, a pleasure to to sort of talk to you guys and uh, to sort of spread the the word that we do have anime fans in the UK, and we're we're just as keen to see all the latest stuff as as you are, and. Uh, Obviously, check out our site for for all of our latest reviews. You know, regardless of, of where you're from, I'd, I'd like to think that they're a, a useful guide to to what's hot and what's not. And we also uh, we also have other articles. I mean, at the moment, we're running a preview of the uh, new anime season in Japan, which has got a whole bunch of trailers and information on all the new shows airing there. So you know, we we do a fair amount of stuff that should be of interest to uh, to US viewers as well. So uh, feel free to drop by our website. Very awesome, and I have to say that now it's time for the 91.8 The Fan Tradition. I think you might know what it is. I do, I think. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you sound like you're dreading it. <laughs> It'll either go very well or very badly. So. <laughs> Basically, we ask everybody who comes on if they'd be willing to say a line for us. Would you be willing? I certainly would. And we do this live on air for any of the mess-ups. We basically ask if you could go. My name is... I do this... And you're tuned into 91.8 The Fan. Okay, okay, let's give it a go. My name's Andy Hanley. I'm from the UK Anime Network, and you're tuned into 91.8 The Fan. See, that wasn't so hard. That wasn't so bad. <laughs> I should make a living out of this. <laughs> and we're all trying. <laughs> but thank you so much for joining the show. It was an absolute pleasure, and I will say that I hope we do this again. Indeed. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a privilege to be part of Canna's Corner. <laughs> and for everybody out there who missed any of the interviews, shame on you. We'll have it up on the website in the next few days. So keep it tuned to 91.8 The Fan. Up next is You Kiss and their song.